It's a key part of radio. It's a key part of media. It's a key part of being a politician. When you start talking, get to your freaking point. All right? Get to your point. Say what you want to say. Stop wasting people's time. And unfortunately, too many people don't have any interest or don't know how to do that. Kamala Harris gave a speech yesterday that was supposed to be her big economic proposal that was going to be rolled out to the American people. Two months after, she was crowned as the Democratic nominee and 40 days to go until the election. And yesterday, we got a lot of nothing. We got a lot of feel-good words. We got a lot of Donald Trump stinks, Donald Trump's rich. But we got nothing of substance. You might have seen some of the clips from this speech that Kamala Harris gave in Pittsburgh yesterday on social media. You might have seen some of it on the cable news. I actually watched it now i had to take a shower after watching it but i did actually watch it (laughs) i'm not proud of it john but sometimes axe body wash oh gosh i've been stinking ever since but i watched it it was about a 39 minute speech and take a guess how long it took kamala harris to get to her first policy proposal in a 39 minute speech You know, I know politicians drag their feet. I would have thought maybe four, five, six, seven, eight, nine minutes. And that's even stretching it. I'm watching that speech last night. And Kamala Harris did not give a single economic proposal, like something to latch on to, a serious economic proposal until the 15 minute and 30 second mark of this speech. And what was that proposal, by the way? What was the big, grandiose, 15 minutes I'm waiting? What's the first proposal? Oh, a tax credit for families for the first year of their child's life. The most practical thing we can do right now is to cut taxes for middle-class families and individuals. (laughs) And that's what we will do. Under my plan, more than 100 million Americans will get a middle-class tax break. That includes $6,000 for new parents during the first year of their child's life. (laughs) To help families cover everything from car seats to cribs. We'll also cut the cost of child care and elder care. And finally, give all working people access to paid leave, which will help everyone caring for children, caring for aging parents. So that was 15 minutes into this speech in Pittsburgh last night. And that's the first policy proposal that you get. A $6,000 tax break for parents for the first year of their child's life. Which, by the way, that's great, but that's pretty niche. Is it not? She mentioned something at the start of that clip about tax cuts for 100 million Americans. There were 3 million babies born last year. What do you think? John Anthony is going to start popping out kids for a $6,000 tax break? That's not happening. You tell me otherwise, John, but I don't think that's happening. It's an interesting proposal from a side that would... uh Not necessarily encourage you to have that first baby. uh, Yes. You square that with their other message. Yes. Took the words right out of my mouth. Well done. That's an interesting part of this as well. So her first, and by the way, there's no substance there. It's just like a $6,000 tax break for the first year of the child's life. And right now, I mean, you know, we know there's a child tax credit worth a couple of grand per kid. Take advantage of it. If you've got kids in the house under the age of uh, 18, So this is a one-year $6,000 tax credit, I guess. I'm still not clear on what exactly it is. But I think I'm done having kids, so too bad I can't take advantage. Yeah. I think Mark's done having kids. I don't know. He's got a 10 and 8. It's it's the De Niro bill, isn't it? Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) You know what? I may have to have a fourth just to get that $6,000 tax credit. (laughs) Oh, my goodness. Like The idea that anybody debates having children over the tax credit that you get from the child is laughable that is spoken like somebody who does not have children that's what it's spoken like 
I, at, at no point have I talked to anybody who is a parent who's like, you know, we were on the fence about that third kid or having that fourth kid, but damn, the government just came in and offered this one-year tax credit, and I couldn't turn it down. I was like, let's go, baby. Come on, honey. Let's have another. Government's helping out. Let's go. <laughs> Woo! Woo! No, that's not how it goes. Six grand that's gone in, what, 90 days when you have a new one? <laughs> well, right? that's Doctors, true as well. Papers, formula. Yep, it goes very quickly, as Mark and I know. So that's the first thing. And then she talks about paid leave. How are you going to force companies to do paid leave? Cutting costs of child care and elder care. Okay, tell me how. We never got a how. Because there's never a how with Kamala Harris. There isn't. Unless she's talking to a Native American group and then she's oh, la, la, la. She, you know, she might pretend. But there's never a how with Kamala Harris. It's just about saying words that hopefully make you feel kind of good. That you don't think below the surface level about. You hear these words and these words are put together and they sound nice. But then when you think about these words, for all of seven seconds, you wonder to yourself, first off, what does this really do for me? Two, how do you do it? And is this really the problem when it comes to growing an economy? Is this really the issue? Is this really the thing that's going to get this economy back on track? The problem with the economy right now and the larger problem is, of course, Three and a half years under Kamala Harris's watch of 20 to 25 percent inflation. That's the problem. If there's something that is holding people back from having children right now, as somebody who is in the midst of having children, it is things like, can we afford just basic everyday needs to meet the child's needs? Now, thankfully, we're in a place personally that we can, but there are millions who are not. In that place right now. And there are millions who say, gosh, I'm in a rental unit. Can I even get myself to a place where I'm buying a two, three, four bedroom home and living that American dream and raising my kids in that home? Can I get to that point right now? Those are the things that the American people are thinking about, whether it's right here in Kansas City or anywhere else in the country. That's what's on their mind. And as I watched 39 minutes and 46 seconds of this speech yesterday, but who's counting? I thought to myself, there are no answers here. This is somebody who is incredibly out of touch and simply wants to say, Trump's a bad man, elect me. I recognize the writing style like in fifth grade when I had to do a 500-word book report. Yes. And you're stretching them out just a little bit here. Oh, there was a lot of that yesterday. Here's the problem, right? The teachers read the book, and we've all seen the movie, so we know (laughs) how it ends, right? Yes, that is exactly what this was. This speech could have been 12 minutes. It was 39. And as always, it was very light on substance, and there's no way. Because no one actually watches these speeches, right? The speeches are for the sound bites that come out of the speeches. That's what they're really for. And, uh, oh, by the way, if you took the under five minutes, I don't know if this was part of your parlay, Mark, but if you took the under five minutes for Kamala Harris to mention she grew up in a middle-class family, ding, 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 you're a winner. Four minutes and 30 seconds. That's I was hoping for that. Yeah, I knew you were. Four minutes and 30 seconds for Kamala to drop the, I grew up in a middle-class family. Millions of Americans are sitting around their own kitchen tables with f***ing ends meet. I grew up in a middle-class family. I understand the pressures of making ends meet. That's right. I grew up in a middle-class family. I don't know what we're talking about for the next three hours and 45 minutes, but I'll just tell the bosses, whatever. I grew up in a middle-class family. What are you going to do about it? 913-408-7957. It really is becoming a great meme. Hey, honey, can you take out the trash? Why didn't you take out the trash last night? Garbage guys came. Well, I grew up in a middle-class family. It is becoming an all-time meme. 913-408-7957. It's 614 on a Thursday morning. Mayor Quentin Lucas is going to be here at uh, 735. And one of his good friends in the mayoral industry, for lack of a better word, 
is finding himself in a very difficult spot. What could that mean for Kansas City? We'll tell you next on KCMO. Something historic happened last night, and I wonder how it impacts us 1,500 miles away. I think it could. Good morning. It's great to be here on KCMO Talk Radio. Yesterday, you had New York City Mayor Eric Adams get indicted by a grand jury on charges connected to a federal probe. Now, the mayor is claiming he is being persecuted by the federal government because he has spoken out about that city's migrant crisis. We know that New York, Chicago, and many other major American cities have just gotten slammed by the migrant crisis. They have had hundreds of thousands, if not millions, end up in their cities because we've had 10 to 15 million illegal immigrants cross our border the last three and a half years, and they've got to go somewhere. They can't all go to Springfield, Ohio. They're tapped out in places like Springfield, Ohio. They dumped allegedly 20,000 in a city of 40,000 people. That's enough. But it's obviously becoming a problem in places like New York. And Mayor Adams has spoken out about it. And what he is now claiming is that the feds are coming after him. He is getting punished because he's had the audacity to speak out about the migrant crisis. The details at this point remain unclear as to the exact accusations, but are believed to be connected to allegations of the Turkish government illegally funneling money into his mayoral campaign in exchange for approval of the Turkish consulate in Manhattan. This is according to the sources at the New York Post. But why? Are you really telling me this is something that the feds would typically be going after? Not saying they shouldn't, but you know as well as I do. The feds go after things that oftentimes certain people want them to go after. And Mayor Eric Adams, while he is a Democrat, obviously, in New York City, he is somebody who has been very outspoken about the migrant issue absolutely destroying that city. And he's right, by the way. And it makes me wonder, is that why maybe a Kansas City mayor, Quint Lucas, is hesitant to push back on some of this migrant stuff when there were reports a few months ago that Kansas City was open to taking migrants from places like Denver, Colorado. Is it all part of, frankly, the Democratic Party plan where they basically feel like they have to take individuals because if not, well, guess what? Their job prospects are done. And we know that these people want to climb the political ladder in their political party. And if they start pushing back on this stuff, they're finished. In a worst case scenario, they end up like Eric Adams. Here's what Eric Adams was saying in recent months about this migrant crisis and how it was impacting his own city. This issue will destroy New York City. Destroy New York City. We're getting 10,000 migrants a month. One time we were just in Venezuela. Now we're in Ecuador. Now we're in Russia speaking, coming through Mexico. Now we're in um, Western Africa. Now we're getting people from all over the globe have made their minds up that they're going to come through the southern part of the border and come into New York City. And everyone is saying it's New York City's problem. Every community in this city is going to be impacted. We got a 12 billion dollar deficit that we're going to have to cut every service in this city is going to be impacted wow he's talking about having to cut services to citizens in that city because of the migrant crisis and how they've been overwhelmed in new york and he's right i mean you know i've got family my in-laws are actually here for the week and My father-in-law was telling me yesterday, as a guy who goes to Manhattan on a regular basis, you know, he's got little kids with parents, three years old, hanging outside of buildings at 5 a.m. You can't get into some of these nice hotels anymore because they've got, you know, law enforcement, federal agents and local agents guarding these hotels, which are now being housed for illegal immigrants. They're no longer hotels and they were decent hotels. Not all that long ago. They are now housing for illegal immigrants. 
right there in prime time real estate of Midtown Manhattan. That's what's happening. Now, New York City is the worst case scenario, obviously, one of the worst case scenarios. And Eric Adams, he believes, is being indicted in part because he's spoken out against his own political party and this migrant crisis that is impacting that city. Now you wonder here in Kansas City, and I've got to ask Quentin Lucas about this when he's on the show in one hour. So if you are not typically here in the 730 segment, you should be here because the mayor will be here. I will ask him about Eric Adams. And I'll also ask him for an update since we haven't talked about it since probably midsummer or spring when the news broke as to whether or not Kansas City is taking in migrants from places like Denver. What numbers? What does that look like? And how even if Quentin Lucas doesn't think it's a great idea or he knows there are downsides to this, is he really in a position to speak out? In many ways, if you're any mayor or any local official in any state in this country and you're a Democrat, this feels like a warning shot from your party, what's going on with Mayor Eric Adams. This feels like a shot to you saying, hey, just make sure you keep your mouth shut here, okay? We don't need you speaking up and speaking out. We've got a plan in place here. These 15 million didn't just show up randomly. It's been part of a potential plan of flooding the country. And if you do what Eric Adams did, well, uh, just make sure your I's are dotted and your T's are crossed. Because if not, we might find something. And you wouldn't want that. You wouldn't want to be the next Eric Adams now, would you? It's hard to not think that that is part of what is going on here. And it seems inherently unfair, but at the same time, Adams put himself in this spot. If these allegations, of course, are true with the Turkish government. But the whole thing just stinks to absolute high heaven. And I just wonder what mayors around the country, you know, since most of them are obviously in blue cities, are thinking about this morning in the wake of that news last night. Coming up, uh, the spin that has taken place. On the Missouri man who was executed, it got national attention. The local spin was stunning. We'll share it with you next. I was flipping around last night on uh, cable news, and there wasn't a ton that was all that interesting. I stumble upon News Nation, and Dan Abrams is leading his show with this Missouri case, Marcellus Williams, who was executed a couple of days ago. And he's talking about the story, and he's doing it with Geraldo Rivera, who I hadn't seen in a while. Geraldo has got to be 80 years old. I mean, yeah, he's 81 years old. My goodness. He still looked good, though, for 81. He wasn't a Joe Biden 81. He looked good for 81. So they're leading their show last night with this story here in Missouri of Marcellus Williams, who was executed after, of course, he was uh, convicted of killing Felicia Gale, who was found stabbed to death in August of 1998 in the St. Louis area. Now, this case has gone on for obviously decades now, and uh, there was a big push here at the end to not move forward with the death penalty for Marcellus Williams. But he was ultimately executed on Tuesday. So uh, what's the angle going to be from the Kansas City Star, right? Because, of course, they obsess over making things like this about race. They can't help themselves. Marcellus Williams was a black man. Um, Now, Felicia Gale, who he is uh, convicted of killing, was a white woman. And this case became as much a racial thing as anything else. And there were a couple of other cable news outlets that picked up on it over the last couple of days. Of course, Joy Reid said it was wrong. But how many times and how many years can you go through a system where you either trust the judicial system or you don't. Now, there's no doubt they get it wrong sometimes. And I am admittedly divided on this one because there was not forensic evidence linking him to the murder, specific DNA evidence linking him to the murder. But he did confess to two people, one being his girlfriend, somebody else being in prison. His purse was found In his vehicle, you have that as well. 
there were obviously several things that led to this individual, Marcellus Williams, being convicted and then being sentenced to death. And it finally happened on Tuesday. But what's the angle from the Kansas City Star? Kansas City Star writes this yesterday afternoon. Marcellus Williams was executed in Missouri. Read his final words and his poetry. His poetry. You know, I don't know whether or not Marcellus Williams did this. We've all seen, if you followed this story, the evidence, right? Some of the evidence I just laid out. He had confessed to it to a couple of people. Now, the defense claimed that his girlfriend just said he confessed because she wanted the money. But she never actually went to claim any of that money during the case. So there's that. He's got the purse. Why does he have the purse? There, yes, are DNA holes in the story. But when you go through this process, you go through this judicial system, uh, you either trust the system in this case or you don't. But I admit, I, I don't think it's a slam dunk. I'm totally willing to say that it doesn't feel like a slam dunk. But I'm not willing to go down the road of, let me read this man's poetry. You know, I, I was just dying. to. Re- I was really curious about Marcel's poetry. The star writes here. Marcellus Khalifa Williams' final statement before he was executed Tuesday night in Missouri was one of simplicity and faith. He wrote, all praise be to Allah in every situation. Wait, is that the poetry? Uh, Where's the poetry? I then continue on through the story, and there's a poem at the very end. And it's titled, An Affair of I. And it was sent to the Kansas City Star earlier this year. And Williams wrote in part, Devious smiles, nervous grins, political sins, legal flips and spins. Fingers begin to bend to form a fist. Then handshakes weakened. Cordially and decorum ends. Cordiality and decorum ends. Constitution blowing in the wind. Panel dismantled according to whims. Governor's patience wearing thin. Been going on too long, been alive too long is what they intend. Execution date sought. How dare anyone question why? Yeah, it's okay. It doesn't even rhyme, but it's all right, I guess. But why is the Kansas City Star publishing this? Why is this one of the angles they are looking to take on this story? Well, because as is always the case, even if somebody may have holes in their execution story, they want to humanize them. Now, do you think they would ever do this for somebody who was indicted on January 6th? Ask yourself that question. I'm not saying one criminal is better than another, but do you ever think in a million years the Kansas City Star would potentially publish a poem to humanize somebody who was riding at the Capitol on January 6th? Hell no is the answer. Of course not. Those are the worst people, the bottom of the barrel human beings in all of society, according to the Kansas City Star. But somebody who there's pretty good evidence. Now, whether or not they should have been executed. okay, fine. We can have that conversation. But there's pretty damn good evidence that they killed somebody, stabbed them 42 times in their apartment in 1998. Let's publish their poem. Let's publish their final words about praising Allah. We definitely need to do that if we're the Kansas City Star. 913-408-7957. But this is par for the course. This is like right up their alley and right on brand for what they want to do and what they like to do. And whether or not it was the right move, I mean, I will ask Quentin Lucas about that too when he's on the show in one hour. Um, He seemed to be coming out against it, and that's fine. But here's what else is very interesting. You know, the Kansas City Star wrote in this story about Governor Mike Parson that last year, Governor Mike Parson disbanded a board of inquiry that had been set up under a previous administration to look into Williams's case. You know who that previous administration was? Eric Reitens. They literally won't write Eric Reitens's name. They don't want to give him any credit for actually being the governor that opened up an inquiry to look into Williams's case. 
Because Eric Greitens is also a guy the Kansas City Star thinks is a bad dude. So we can't possibly put his name in this article and give him an ounce of credit for being the governor who put together a board of inquiry to look into the Marcellus Williams case here in Missouri. They can't possibly do something like that. This is the journalism that we get in Kansas City. And this is why you got to stay here with us on KCMO Talk Radio, where we'll really tell you what the heck's going on in this town and in our region, and we'll do it in a straight, fair, honest manner. Because for too many, they are not interested in doing that. 913-408-7957. This is on the text line. Pete, they won't publish a January 6th poem, but they'll cover the story to death. One woman got a 14-day sentence, and the Kansas City Star used two-thirds of a page on that story. I, don't be I, – I mean, that's hysterical. It's embarrassing. But I'm in no way surprised by that at all. I'd like to hear a poem from the shaman, honestly. Yeah, yeah. Let's see what he has to say and do some coffee house snaps. There you <laughs> It's like you've done these poetry readings before, Mark. I've been to a couple. You've been to a couple poetry readings? Okay, you're fired. <laughs> Thanks poetry for Poetry slams. <laughs> Is that what you call them? Yeah. Oh. Back in my soy boy days. <laughs> oh, <laughs> back when you had your lattes, Mark, every morning. Oh, yeah. Your emo haircut and the whole thing. Uh-huh. Okay. Yeah. Well, you've come a long way. You've really grown up in front of our eyes, haven't you there, Mark? It's nice to see. Father of three, Mark Van Sickle, growing up every single day. Now he's got to start hitting some parlays on his Chiefs bets, and then we're really cooking. That's right. Maybe a Royals bet later. That's right. He's got his Royals fountains hat on again. He's looking good in there on the other side of the glass. Coming up on uh, KCMO Talk Radio. Who is cutting your taxes here locally? A county announced yesterday they are cutting your taxes in a big way. And they're doing it for all the right reasons. We'll tell you which county in Kansas City area is doing that next on KCMO 95.7 FM. Congratulations. If you are a resident in Platte County, Missouri, you are getting a major property tax break. And why? Well, because you have county officials who actually want to go about and do the right things on behalf of their taxpayers, which is rare to see at the county government level or any governmental level, for that matter. So how about this? Uh, Platte County taxpayers will get a break from property tax assessments for the next two years. The county commission voted unanimously this week to reduce the county's property tax levy from 0.06 to 0.01. One cent for every $100 of assessed value after homeowners faced rising property values. So Scott Fricker, who's going to be on the show, by the way, at 815, um, he is the presiding commissioner in Platte County. He said they were able to reduce the levy thanks to an excess of sales tax funds over the last few years. Now, remember, inflation actually helps the government because if the cost of everything goes up 20 percent, sales tax revenues go up 20 percent. And that's if you don't have any additional residents or any additional foot traffic coming in. And we know that Platte County is one of the faster growing areas of our region. So Scott Fricker says that Platte County has already used some of the funds to cover its general operating and capital reserves funds. And he said here to KCUR, quote, we just have excess cash. The only way we can give money back to the taxpayer is through a decreased property tax levy. The alternative was to spend the money and grow the government. That's not what we are interested in doing here in Platte County. Oh, my goodness. Oh, how refreshing is that? To hear from somebody in politics saying, we have too much of your money. And the only way we can really give it back to you is through this property tax uh, levy coming down. So that's what we're going to do. God bless you up there in Platte County. Man, you guys are fortunate, I'll tell you. And anytime I've done an event in Platte County, and I'm not blowing smoke when I say this. I'm really not. I've said it on air. I've said it at events. If I could live anywhere in the metro where I didn't care about driving to work in 10 minutes, I'd be up there in Platte County. And now I see this, and I'm like, you know what? Screw it. I'm going to do the 40-minute drive every day. I don't care. It's worth it. I mean, this is the kind of stuff you want from your elected officials. Meantime, go to Johnson County and... <laughs> I've got the numbers here. The excess reserves in Johnson County, Kansas, 
for somebody I talked to last night. $462 million of our money they're just sitting on. Just hanging out with, you know, in case of an emergency. Like Dave Ramsey talks about having three to six months in an emergency fund just in case, you know, you lose your job, something happens, car breaks down, whatever it might be, right? Well, uh, I'm sure Johnson County has like six years worth of reserves because you can never be too careful. You can never have too much in that piggy bank when it's other people's money. And then there's Platte County coming out this week and saying, you know, we got too much of your stuff. We don't want more of your money. So please, just we're going to make sure that you can keep as much as possible. Now, here's the problem, though, for places like Platte County. The creep starts. People start moving into your county because of things like, hey, low taxes, cheaper property, good lifestyle. But then what do they do? They vote for the same crap that they moved away from. And that's how places like Platte County slowly change. So what you've got to be careful on in Platte County is maintaining what is making it a great place to live. That's what's got to happen. And that's difficult to do. I mean, we're seeing it happen in front of our eyes in places around Kansas City. Arguably, it's happening in Johnson County right now. So just, I'm happy for you up there in Platte, but now you got to protect what you got as well. you got to be smart about it. Now, in the meantime, speaking of taxes, you know, if there's one economic policy of Donald Trump's that's really not sitting well with me, it would be the tariffs. If you haven't seen some of the stories, some of the commentary, you know, Donald Trump the other day threatened uh, John Deere for wanting to move some of its U.S.-based production over to Mexico. And Trump said that uh, he's notifying John Deere that if you do move from Pennsylvania to Mexico, we are going to put a 200% tariff on everything that you want to sell in the United States. Now, this is just a bad idea. Now, I don't think it's actually going to come to fruition in this case. I think Trump does these things as kind of a threat. He actually has preserved American jobs by doing this when he was in office the first time around. It was Caterpillar who I think wanted – no, no, no. Who was – oh, it was CNH, farm equipment manufacturer CNH, who wanted to move jobs from Wisconsin to Mexico. And uh, Trump basically told some of these companies, hey – No, you're not going to do that. If you do that, we're going to hit you with a big tariff. And he was able to preserve some jobs in the United States. Carrier as well was another company that he did this with. They wanted to move some of their air conditioning manufacturing from Indiana to Mexico. And he threatened to impose tariffs on carrier imports. And they scaled back some of those U.S. jobs cuts after the state of Indiana dangled subsidies as well. So there was a whole, you know, bunch of shenanigans that went on with this stuff. I don't mind Trump kind of threatening it as a way to say, hey, don't do this. Don't do this. I think it's more of a business one-on-one thing than it is like he's actually going to do it. And I'm okay with that because we lived through four years of Donald Trump and the overwhelming comparison to Joe Biden is nothing but a net positive. It's not even close. That being said, I don't like this idea of just willy-nilly slapping tariffs on imports from different parts of the country or different parts of the world. I'm not. Because what it would ultimately do is raise U.S. prices. And the last thing you want to do is give Kamala Harris a reason to portray that she would be friendlier to business, which she is not in any way, shape, or form. But you don't want to give her the opportunity to make that case. Now, the problem is she is so economically illiterate, she can't make that case. That's the good news for Trump. But you also don't want to be in a situation where you're like, you know what? You get hit with tariffs. You get hit with tariffs. And you get hit with tariffs. And if I'm Donald Trump, here's the case I'm making to big business and medium business and small business. I'm the guy that got the corporate tax rate down to 21%. Kamala Harris wants to get it back up to 28%. Trump would be better off talking about the great things he did with deregulation extending the 2017 tax reform and then explaining how that will help U.S. manufacturers invest more in the United States and ultimately raise the wages of the American worker. Donald Trump's biggest selling point economically 
is that first term economy where his supply side policies worked. But right now, when you hear about economic policy from Donald Trump, what you hear a lot more about is tariffs. And that's not going to help the economy if he wins. So he's better off highlighting how his supply side policies worked during his four years in office, obviously all pre-COVID, but everything was clicking and it was working and wages were rising and they were rising based on a percentage at a higher rate. The lower you go down the food chain, then the higher you go up the food chain. Those at the bottom end of the socioeconomic level were gaining more and making more on a percentage basis than the higher end of the socioeconomic ladder. And that's a testament to his policies. I'd be talking more about that and more about how we're going to make it so appealing for all businesses to work and operate right here in America that nobody's going to want to leave. I don't have to threaten you with tariffs because at this point, if you leave, you'd be a fool to leave because we are going to deregulate. We're going to set up this economy where it's going to be humming just like it was from 2017 and 2019. That's the case I'd be laying out, not the tariff game, which sounds good to some people, but really ultimately doesn't work. And is more of a net negative than it is anything else. Coming up next on KCMO, the good news, though, for Donald Trump is this. His opponent is speaking. And his opponent is speaking more than she ever has. And when his opponent is in the limelight and is speaking, that is great news for Donald Trump. The sit-down interview with MSNBC was a doozy last night, and we've got it with you next. There's got to be some test that if you want to be president, you have to take to prove you know Economics 101. Like, there just there needs to be something like that. And here's the thing. If there was something like that, I'm pretty sure our current vice president and presidential nominee would fail it and fail it miserably. Because if you watched any of this MSNBC interview that was done last night with Stephanie Rule. You would have seen somebody who does not have the answers to how to fix the economy, how this whole deficit thing works that we have $36 trillion in debt because of, you know, how you've got to balance a budget ideally, although admittedly both parties have failed colossally at that. Uh, But this is not somebody who is serious when it comes to economic policies or economic ideas. And that is the number one issue that people care about right now. And it's not even close. So Kamala Harris last night does a sit down with Stephanie Rule. This came after her speech in Pittsburgh that uh, was 39 minutes of a lot of nothing that I'll get to here throughout the morning on KCMO. But Stephanie Rule is a friendly, as we like to call it. Stephanie Rule is somebody who is with MSNBC, used to work for Bloomberg, came to MSNBC about a decade ago and is, you know, what you would expect from somebody on MSNBC. So this is very safe territory for Kamala Harris. But Stephanie Rule stumped her and stumped her in a pretty big way. Take a listen. Expanding that child tax credit, or you mentioned housing before, giving that extra money for a first home. If you can't raise corporate taxes or if GOP takes control of the Senate, where do you get the money to do that? Do you still go forward with those plans and borrow? Well, but we're going to have to raise corporate taxes and we're going to have to raise... We're going to have to make sure that the biggest corporations and billionaires pay their fair share. That's just it. It's about paying their fair share. I am not mad at anyone for achieving success, but everyone should pay their fair share. And it is not right that the teachers and the firefighters that I meet every day across our country are paying a higher tax than the richest people in our country. Oh, my goodness. It's so exhausting. The question was, hey, where do you get the money to pay for this stuff? Would you go into debt to pay for these things if Republicans don't allow you to raise the corporate tax rate from 21 to 28 percent? And if you're thinking on your feet and this is not like rocket science, right? I'm just doing this right now, having this conversation with you on KCMO. The answer would be a very simple one. I will find other things to cut in the budget Because right now it's too important to give middle class families a tax cut. That's what you say. And it's not difficult to do. It's pretty vague, right? You keep it vague if you're Kamala Harris. But you say this is the issue right now that I think will help out working families with little kids. $6,000 tax credit. 
which is something she talked about yesterday in Pittsburgh. And we've got to do it so I will find other places to save money in the budget because this is something we have to do. And if Republicans won't let me raise the corporate tax rate, which is a bad idea, by the way, but if they won't let me raise the corporate tax rate, then I will figure out where else I can save money to make sure I can get this economic policy through because this is what working families in America need right now. See how I did that? And it's really not that hard. Like, it's, I promise you, it's not that difficult to come up with that answer. Instead, what does Kamala Harris say there? Well, we have to. We've got no choice. And then the whole, rich must pay their fair share. Broke out the Bernie Sanders note card from the pantsuit for that one. Yeah, I'm sick of the firefighters paying more than Bill Gates. Okay, that's because we have this thing called a capital gains tax and Bill Gates doesn't draw a W-2 salary. And if you make capital gains taxes the same as, let's say, income taxes, you will quickly destroy the stock market. But it sounds good if you literally don't know what you're talking about or you hope your audience is totally clueless, which is typically the case on shows like MSNBC. But you don't just have to take my word for it, by the way. You don't. You might say, well, come on, you've you know got to lean on this thing, so we know how you're going to say and react to it. Well, this is Stephanie Rule, who did the interview last night, reacting to the interview with Kamala Harris on MSNBC. Talk about that answer. I do, but here's what's a little tricky. She doesn't answer the question around... If the GOP is controlling the Senate, if she can't raise corporate taxes, where is she going to get the money from, is, you know, to expand the child tax credit and do all the things she wants to do? And she says, we just have to do it. And that's great. And that's a campaign promise. But 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 the issue is, if it means we're just going to borrow again, then what we're doing is we're just never addressing the deficit. And back in the days when you were a proud Republican, debts and deficits mattered. Yeah. Uh, that's Stephanie Rule saying she doesn't answer the questions. She fails to answer the questions. And these are not difficult questions, by the way. She's not coming on this show. She's not, you know, going to places where they're really going to grill her. This is softball type stuff. And she's screwing it up. And it becomes very clear, though, that this is why her handlers have hid her for the last two months. And why are they doing this stuff right now? Because they think they have to. And that's the concerning part. They're not doing interviews because they feel they really just want to start talking to the American people. They Trust me, that's not it. I think the reason they're doing this is because they realize that Kamala Harris hiding is hurting her campaign. And it is hurting her campaign. So now they're like, crap, we got to get her out there. What are we doing? We're doing economic speeches in Pittsburgh. And I watched it last night. It was 39 minutes. And we didn't get a policy proposal until the 15 and a half minute mark. It was 15 minutes of nothing. And then we got a policy proposal about lowering child care costs, which there was nothing of substance attached to, and a $6,000 tax credit for parents in the first year of their child's life. There was nothing there there. I watched it. I didn't just, you know pull some of the highlights or lowlights that you're seeing on X and Facebook and Instagram. I watched it and there was not a single policy proposal until the 15 minute and 30 second mark. So I believe this is her campaign saying we're getting killed on the economy. People don't know our candidate. We've got to get her out there. We don't have a choice. If they were winning by five points, they wouldn't be doing this stuff. Trust me, they would not be doing economic speeches in Pittsburgh. They would not be sitting down in MSNBC if they were up by five points. But I'm telling you, some of the polling this week we've told you about is not come back well for Kamala Harris. The Quinnipiac polls and some of the others have Trump up nationally, which a Republican has not won a popular vote in 20 years. And if that's coming back on left-leaning polls, what does that tell you? I mean, I was talking to a buddy of mine yesterday in Florida He has never voted for Donald Trump. He's mid-50s. Never voted for Donald Trump. Voted for Obama twice, Hillary, and Biden. He did vote for Republicans 20-plus years ago. He has voted across the aisle. 
But he was telling me yesterday, he goes, I'm undecided. But he goes, I can't vote for Kamala Harris. He doesn't like Trump. You know, he's got all that going on. But he's like, I can't vote for her. I just can't do it. And I'm getting the vibe that there are millions of Americans in that very situation right now wondering what the heck they're going to do. Paul's in Kansas City. He's uh, first up in the 7 o'clock hour. Paul, good morning. You're on KCMO. Hey, Pete. Yeah, I watched that Pittsburgh speech, too. And something stood out to me. She says, you know, it takes too long to uh, complete a bridge, a government bridge, from concept to completion. And I said, did you read the Inflation Reduction Act that you passed with your vote? All the regulations and requirements that a company's got to get to get a government job in the regulations you passed? No wonder bridges don't get completed. <laughs> well, that's a great point. And, you know, we got some of those same problems here in Kansas City. The city's like, no one wants to build here. It's like, yeah, the city, the Kansas City, Missouri City Council passed so many regulations around green energy. Builders don't want to do business here. Exactly. That's exactly right. But you got to hire so many union apprentices. You got to hire so many yep. union this. Read the inflation reduction. I'm, I'm, I'm watching her. I'm like. You, you just keep, they can't let her out in public. When she says things like that, people like me are like, yeah, we know bridges take too long. Any government project because of your your policy. Let's bring her yeah. out to the uh, 69 Highway here and go on that racetrack for a little bit. <laughs> yes, My <sir>. goodness. Uh, <laughs> thanks so much. We You know, drive down 69 Highway to get to church and the kids are ready to puke by the time we get there going down 69. My goodness, they got to get that thing done too. And I won't. Donald Trump announcing that he is set to return to Butler, Pennsylvania. He will be holding an outdoor rally at the very same location of the first assassination attempt from mid-July. Can you believe it? We have to say it that way as well. The first assassination attempt of Donald Trump. Donald Trump is going to stand in the same spot, in the same field, on October 5th. At the Butler Farm Show Fairgrounds, which is a suburb north of Pittsburgh, where he came within a quarter inch of losing his life. Doesn't matter what you think of Donald Trump, it's kind of irrelevant to the conversation. Not only is it incredibly ballsy to do that, it also sends, forget an incredible political message, it sends an incredible message about America, about not backing down about standing up, about not letting the evil that exists in America and the evil that exists in the world get you down, scare you. It's a message that we really haven't had in this country since probably post 9-11. I would say George W. Bush standing down there in downtown Manhattan on the rubble after 3,000 people were killed on September 11, 2001. That's the last time you had, and not that this is that, but it's the last time you had something that I think is comparable. Where an American president stands up and says, I'm not going to be shaken. I'm not going to live in fear. And by the way, Americans should not live in fear. And to me, that's as much what this rally on October 5th is going to be about for Donald Trump. It's not about Trump. You know, if you've seen one Trump rally, you've seen most of them. It's funny, it's a comedy show, it's off the cuff, it's entertainment. But what it signals and what it signifies is somebody who, at a time when America needs someone and needs something to latch on to, that is, uh, when you think about what you want to have out of your president, right? Somebody who's able to basically stand up to the worst actors, not just in the world, but also in America, Which one of these two is willing to do that right now? Donald Trump or Kamala Harris? You ask yourself that. Who do you feel most confident in when you go to sleep at night as an American citizen and feel like, you know what? If that call does come in at 2 a.m. to the president of the United States of World War III getting underway, who do I want taking that call at 2 in the morning? Donald Trump or Kamala Harris? Are you able to do that without your personal feelings on the individual getting in the way. Because if you are, the very obvious answer to that question is Donald Trump. And the significance of him showing back up in Butler, Pennsylvania, and standing there in what is now one of the most iconic fields 
in American history, let's be honest, is going to be a powerful moment. And Trump knows that. This is where Donald Trump's innate ability to understand media and understand optics serves him very well. He knows what that moment's going to look like on October 5th. It is going to be incredibly powerful. And it just so happens to be in basically the state that may very well decide the presidential election. He gets that. But a lot of people may not want to relive it. Just the human being side of you and me may not want to relive that. Trump, for whatever reason, either doesn't care or wants to relive it. And or he understands the powerful message that it will send to the American people. That we don't back down. We don't let evil determine how we act. We don't react to evil and hide. We face it head on. And that's what Donald Trump is a couple of weeks away from doing when he goes back to Butler, Pennsylvania. And to me, what could be one of the iconic and deciding moments of these last 40 days of this presidential election. And I wondered if he was going to go back to that town. I wondered if he was going to want to go back to that town. And then we found out yesterday that he will indeed be going back on October the 5th. And he will be sending a very clear message, not just to himself and his family and, you know, those in his inner circle, but to the rest of the American people that we are not going to back down from evil. And nor should we. And frankly, with everything going on in the world and in this country right now, that's a message that should resonate with Republicans with independents, and yes, also with Democrats.